Ah oui. Au oh, moins, je vais faire attention quand même. Bon, ça oui. Ok. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abiola Irele, and I'm visiting professor in African American and African Studies and Romance Languages and Literatures. It is my pleasure to be with you this evening and to uh, moderate this uh, symposium, which we have entitled, Why is Paris Burning? Of course, you know where the, that uh, title comes from. You know, the, the idea of Paris burning during the Second World War, which had been decreed by the, uh, by the Germans. I hope we can continue. So it's my pleasure then to, of course, you're all aware of the events which have uh, motivated this symposium, the riots in, in France, the problems of immigration. Everybody knows that the French have always prided themselves on being on the liberal tradition, which has uh, enabled them uh, historically to integrate different populations, different ethnicities, across Europe to start with, and then, of course, later on across the world. And these events, the riots in France, the problems with immigration of Africans and Arabs is something that has been, in fact, troubling the French for some years, for, for some decades now. There have been signs, there have been symptoms, and the, all this, of course, has erupted in, this, uh, in the events that we've been witnessing, either directly on, the te on television in, in recent months. The question that we are going to try and answer is what went wrong? That is the discrepancy between the official, uh, shall we say, philosophy, the official ideology of a France, one and indivisible, which, is, uh, which has integrated all these populations, and the reality of the ambiguous situation, the separation you know, of Africans and Arabs. If this is a problem that has actually been very particular to Africans and Arabs. There have been Spanish people, there have been Poles, there have been various nationalities integrated in the French nation. But there has been a particular problem with Africans and Arabs. So we want to ask, we want to answer, we want to at least examine the question, what went wrong? And we have assembled a panel here. I'm going to introduce the speakers. To my immediate left, we have uh, Professor Daniel Maxima, who is himself French, that is uh, from uh, Guadeloupe. And uh, he's, um, I will try and get to his, uh, yeah, he's a poet, essayist, novelist, and public servant. He was born and raised at the base, of, at, the, at the bottom of the volcano Souffrière in Saint-Claude, Guadeloupe. Geography is an essential component in his work, the hurricanes, the volcano, the multiple islands, and languages of the archipelago, the Caribbean archipelago. Maximin's novels are those of a poet who develops diverse motifs, composing more like a musician than a writer. His best known works include the romantic trilogy L'Isolé Soleil, Souffrière, and L'Île et une nuit, which many have called a true love song to the West Indian culture. He has been made a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, 1993, Chevalier of Arts and Letters, 1995. He's been a recipient of the Prix Arc-en-Ciel for his poetry collection, L'Invention de Désirade. And most recently, recipient of the Coveted Literature Prize, the Prix Boris Genevois of the Académie Française, 2004, for his autobiographical novel, Tu, c'est l'enfance. Maximin is one of the major writers that the French Antilles has produced. After completing his studies in letters and social sciences at the Sorbonne in Paris, Maximin served as lecturer at the Institute of Social Studies and professor of literature and anthropology at Orly. Between 1980 and 1989, Maximin served as literary director of the Edition Présence Africaine and produced the program Antipode on France Culture. 
1997, he was appointed president of the Interministerial Mission for the National Celebration of the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery, which took place in 1848. He is currently serving as counsel of the arts and the culture mission within the Ministry for National Education and is in fact in charge of a whole year celebration um, of, uh, which is going to be devoted to the francophonie as concept and of course spe specifically to the literature. Next to him is Christopher, Professor Christopher Stone. I will try and um, introduce him in a minute. Professor Stone is the Guggenheim Professor of the Practice of Criminal Justice here at the Kennedy School of Government. His research focuses on the transnational comparison of crime and criminal justice policies. And he is frequently consulted on these subjects by governments around the world. His most recent, recent published paper concerns the use of force by police in confronting public disorder. Next to him is Professor Edward Glazer, who is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Here at the Kennedy School, he serves as director of the Tobman Center for State and Local Government and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He started researching riots in the early 1990s and is the author of The Early Riot and the Economics of Urban Unrest, which was published in the Journal of Urban Economics. He is also the author of a recent book entitled Fighting Poverty in the US, A World of Difference. Finally, we have Professor Mantia Jawara, who is from uh, Mali. He received a PhD in comparative literature from Indiana University and an MA in literature from American University. He is a leading documentary filmmaker, theorist, and scholar of Africana studies. He is the author of several acclaimed books, including We Won't Budge, which is specifically, in fact, which begins, in fact, with an encounter with, uh, with the Paris police. Uh, Mali now, Mali Co, and More Fait de Tout le Monde, uh, 2001, In Search of Africa, Harvard University Press, African Cinema, Politics, and Culture, Indiana University Press, 1992, and Black American Cinema, Aesthetics and Spectatorship, Routledge, 1993. His film credits include Conakry Cass, 2004, and Rouge in Reverse, that is Jean Rouge in Reverse. And Jarawara is the editor and founder of the noted journal Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, it's a bilingual journal. So um, we would like to start by inviting Professor uh, Mantia Jawara, incidentally, he has to leave fairly early. He'll be leaving around uh, 7 o'clock, so he's going to speak first. Mantia? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Abiola Irele. I also want to thank the D Boys Center and Karen and Skip Gates for inviting me. I just flew all the way from Accra. And, uh, of course, the Kennedy School for having me here. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, to be efficient, I have about eight pages. I'm going to just read fast through this and then see if I can do anything meaningful after that. Uh, I do not wish here to repeat some of the things that I said in my book, We Won't Budge, regarding recent African immigration into France and the teasing out of French racism, xenophobia, and police violence against people of color, regardless of their citizenship, statue, of, or origin. The damage has been done and it was televised around the world to the detriment of some politicians and the gain of others, to the embarrassment of some and the satisfaction of others. But what could France do to avoid similar or worse fires down the line? First, the French need a national conversation on race. But given that it is a taboo to mention the word race or ethnicity in such conversation, the French at the very least should open a public debate around the marginalization and exclusion of people of color from politics, the media, the schools, and the business sectors. In the absence of such a national conversation on race, what we have is, in fact, the lack of the freedom to express oneself on such matters. The French insist that Americans are aberrant 
because of their obsession with racial discourses, ethnicity, and identity politics. They find themselves at liberty to criticize Americans for being politically correct, for, be, for maintaining racism through affirmative action, and for a savage multiculturalism that a French Jewish philosopher, Alain Finkelkraut, labels as multiracism. They say that they do not want to see France divided into ethnic and therefore racist communities with quotas and identification labels like the United States. Ironically, the French do not take advantage of the same freedom of expression when it comes to denouncing citizenship and social inequalities in France. The French intellectuals and the media have remained silent for a long time on racial injustices in, the, in their midst. They are no major professors of color at the top French universities, no major politicians or CEOs. The French media could not even produce statistics of such an injustice because it is against the law to identify people by their ethnic origins, gender, or sexual orientation. The French intellectuals since Sartre and the 1968 upheavals have abandoned their critique of France's role at home and abroad. France needs civil societies and public spheres where frank dis discussions on race could take place. It is only in this manner that we can address the freedom of expression that I'm talking about here. But without such a conversation, the racial debate is left to the two, to two extremist wings of the French society. On one end, we have the National Front and Jean-Marie Le Pen, and on the other hand, we have the racial imams, the, the radical imams. It's no accident that French conservatives like the current interior minister, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, and the philosopher Alain Finkelkraut have embraced Le Pen's position, and that the black comedian Diedonné and the rappers and other youth in the banlieue have radicalized their position on belonging, citizenship, and anti-assimilation. The silence on racism for fear of mentioning the word race and ethnicity, and therefore being called a racist has led to another conundrum, the debate around immigration. The politicians with the complicity of the media have blamed all of France's problem on the sub-Saharan and North African immigrant that they judge as culturally inferior and incapable of assimilating to French culture. The immigrant is stigmatized as a menace to French civilization. It is said that immigrants bring polygamy in France. They have large families that are dependent on the French welfare system. They practice female genital mutilation, and they are branded as drug dealers and as Muslim fundamentalists. Thus, the public debate about immigration takes the place of the conversation on race. Some in the French government have blamed the riots on polygamous children who do not know how to act in a proper French manner. These same government officials have attacked the old French law of regroupement familial, or the reuniting of the immigrant and his family from home. They accuse the immigrant of abusing this law by bringing several wives in France. The Minister of Interior has called for the expulsion of some of these families, even if they are French citizens, if they were involved in the riots. Clearly, immigration is a problem in France and the rest of Europe. It is a complex issue that I have no time to go into here. But anybody who knows anything about the immig immigrants from North and Sub-Saharan Africa all knows, also knows that they, they are peaceful people li uh, living in clandestinity and trying their best to avoid the brutal French CRS police. A tiny minority among them may be drug dealers and radical imams, but most immigrants are in France primarily to do jobs that French people turn down. To put it in another way, most Francophone African immigrants with the minimum education have left France a long time ago to look for new opportunities in North America and more liberal places in Europe. Those who are still in France are manual workers with no other qualification or choice. We must therefore come to the realization that the majority of the rioters were French youth of color and whites that some government officials insist on calling as immigrants or Africans and Arabs. They may be children of people from North and Sub-Saharan Africa, but they are not Africans and Arabs. Some of them have never set foot in Africa and they do not speak any African languages. They only know France and they only speak French. 
They are the new citizens and candidates for liberté, égalité, fraternité. They grew up in French schools where they were taught the values of assimilation, national unity, and the universal equality of individuals. And they found themselves discriminated against by the police and public institutions. Now they find many contradictions between what they were promised through education on the one hand and what they experience daily, daily on the other hand they are beginning to speak out. But you remember what Jean-Paul Sartre had said once, once said uh, in his introduction to Le Paul Sedar Senghor's anthology, Anthology de la Nouvelle Poésie Negre et Malgasse de Langue Française. Sartre argued that the French people would not like being perceived and judged by those that they had colonized. Since they had always looked at the colonized and judged him, her, they would not enjoy hearing from him that colonialism was oppressive and evil. But for Sartre, it was necessary for French men to listen to what the black African, the Arab, and other wretched of the earth had to say. The historical condition in those days was such that decolonization movements had heated up. There was Indochina and Algeria soon after. In Paris, the negrity poets had returned the gauge, and French people were object of perception in a rapidly changing world. Sartre correctly thought that it was important for the French people to try to understand what the other was saying. Sartre went as far as to call Senghor's anthology the most committed in France at the time. But we're not talking about the colonizer and the colonized, nor even about immigration, even though there are some elements of both. We are talking about children whose ancestors may have issued from colonialism or even slavery, counting the French Caribbeans today. Today, there are more than 8 million people of Arab and African descent living in France. They suffered humiliation at the hand of the authorities, and their civil rights and citizenship rights are continually violated by people who treat them as foreigners simply on the basis of their skin color. To borrow an expression from W.B. Du Bois, the father of race sociology in Africa, they experience a double consciousness as the manifestation of living simultaneously within and behind a veil. I'll go quicker because I know everybody is fighting for time. The first. Therein lies the paradox to France today. Position the veil in one way for a particular result or another for a totally different one. Adjust the definition of universalism in light of new modernities and alternative globalization or maintain the old concept of French universalism so dear to, nas to the National Front and other conservatives and racists. Either way, you will have a different France, democratic and dynamic or old, conservative and xenophobic. The first choice is obvious, obviously what all of us who love France wish for. However, to be flexible with the definition of universalism does not mean to fall back on relativism or to retreat from reason, or even to lock ourselves into some form of fixed identity politics. It means that a strategy has to be found to include the other children of France in the nation without reducing them to an outdated identity of Frenchness or ethnic abs absolutism. Ne next to this dream of multicultural France, there is currently an absolutist and ethnocentric model of universalism that prevails in most institutions and public spheres. It picks on trivial symbols as Arab girls wearing the veil to go to school and exclude them from the French family. It denies French citizenship to black children children born in the suburbs of Paris because their parents came there illegally. It mobilizes the image of racial imams, lawbreakers, and the unemployed to, demo, de, to mo, demonize whole communities that it declared as unfit to include in the family. In short, this tendency relies on stereotypes with, uh, and of, with the, uh, sorry stereotypes and outward forms of representation as weapons in a war against the other. It tried to maintain French children of African and Arab descent in a position of being perceived as foreigners. If the French 
stay on the course of ethnic absolutism, they will not only be forced to reject some of their children, but also the idealism that made them universal around the world, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Now, you, the universalism they should want to defend is freedom and democracy for the oppressed. Finally, a courageous France need to take sides in the identity, uh, need not take side in the identitarian and political struggle between the National Front and the veiled Muslim girls. For me, they're both symptoms of a changing world in which, okay, I'm reading literally my last sentence. D'accord, so, okay. <laughs> Sorry. For me, they're both symptoms of a changing world in which their roles are rapidly diminishing. They may hide behind a flag or envelop themselves with it but they are not the torch bearers. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. yes, okay. Yeah. I would like to call on Professor Glazer to uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, I'm, and I'm delighted that the Talman Center is a co-sponsor of this event, so I can learn from these people who know so much more about the French situation than I do. Um, I have been involved in, in a, as a student of, of riots uh, for the past 15 years and, and find them uh, obviously both troubling and, and fascinating. And I think I'll just report to you where I think the economics, uh, the economics literature on riots uh, is. First of all, the first thing I think that's crucial to remember is the things that cause riots are not the same thing as the things we want to do about them. Okay? The solutions to riots and the causes of, of riots are not at all the same thing necessarily. So for example, um, we may want deeply to address the inequality and unfair conditions that face uh, people of African descent in Paris, but it, it may not be obvious that that's actually the right policy response to riots, and, and I'll come back to this in a second, um, but it may be obvious that we want to pursue that policy. Second point, um, the essence of a riot is that there are sufficiently many people who are breaking the law that normal law enforcement breaks down. That's how actually you should think about a riot conceptually. There's in some sense a... a a, a, a congestion of law enforcement because so many people are out on the streets that it's impossible to arrest all the offenders. It should be seen in part as being a law enforcement problem and it should be seen in part as being a tipping point phenomenon. That once you get enough people who are out on the street who are congesting law enforcement, it becomes impossible uh, to actually maintain normal, normal law and order. Um, third, and connecting with this, this theme of law and order, one of the most reliable correlates of lack of riots across countries is actually dictatorship. In fact, dictatorships on average have 25% fewer riots over the 1970 to 1990 period than democracies do. In the words of the great students of revolution and riot of the 19th century, Tilly, Tilly, and Tilly, repression works. Obviously, this does not mean that I am suggesting that repression is an appropriate policy, but it is something to keep in mind when thinking about how actually riots, uh, riots function and what, and what goes on. Um, at the same time, obviously, it's worthwhile remembering that repressive policing, particularly insensitive policing, is so often the flashpoint that starts riots, whether or not it's the um, LA riot of 1991, the Miami riot, or Watts. All of them had as flashpoints police inappropriately behaving, which is why I'm so excited that Chris is here to sort of talk about this sort of combined problem that police are obviously necessary to maintain law and order, but so often a lack of connection between the police and the community is a crucial role in starting riots uh, to begin with. Point number uh, four, riots are intimately related with urbanization and physical space more generally. Riots across countries are closely connected with the density at which people live, tall buildings and, and the sort of Corbusier type uh, uh, architectural structure seems to be related to all forms of crime on the street, not just, not just riots. Um, and certainly in the history of Paris, the very space of Paris, particularly the right bank, is associated with Napoleon III's desire to eliminate riots and revolutions by building broader streets, and, and this, of course, was done by Baron Haussmann. Obviously, proximity is related to the, to the closeness between rioters and targets, uh, and also related to the congestion of law enforcement. Point number five. There is no discernible relationship in the data either across uh, cities or across countries between poverty, and in, between poverty and riots or between inequality and riots. These things are just not correlated with each other. And in fact, over time within the US, in fact, riots exploded during a period, particularly the African-American riots in the 1960s, when things were getting better, not things were getting worse. 
Again, this doesn't mean that inequality isn't an absolutely crucial topic for us to, us to think about, but to then justify policies against inequality as being anti-riot policies, it's a mistake. It it's, uh, certainly doesn't come out of the data. On the other hand, and also let me just emphasize on that point, historically, riots have often occurred when richer majority groups have victimized poor minorities. Right? The classic American race riot prior to 1945 was not a disenfranchised, beaten down African American revolting against an unfair white cop. It was a vicious white mob beating up a poor uh, African American. This is the 1905 Atlanta riot. This is the 1919 Chicago riot when a poor black child was pulled by the undertow into a white area and you know, a bloodbath ensued as whites beat up blacks. There's not in any sense an obvious thing that those whites were victims of some sort of inequality that caused that. Again, you know, um, inequality and poverty are important topics that certainly need addressing, but we shouldn't necessarily conclude that they are the causes of riots. On the other hand, unemployment is big. Across the US, having larger shares of particularly unemployed young males is systematically correlated with the presence of riots in the 1960s. And in fact, the remarkable thing about South Central LA is just how many unemployed young African Americans they were. The unemployment rate was 25% uh, in that group as opposed to 15% for African Americans uh, in the country as a whole. The poverty rates, by the way, for South Central LA and for African Americans more generally in the US were the same. It's not unusual in poverty, it's unusual in having a lot of people who aren't finding a meaningful way to spend their lives without a high opportunity cost of time. This is surely huge in terms of thinking about Europe. Right? Other work that I've, I have done sort of strongly argues that uh, labor market regulations and the sort of in general uh, um, closeness of the labor markets have meant that so many young French people, particularly those people who are um, outsiders to the traditional French system, have been cut off from meaningful jobs because of the, the political regulatory system. Surely this is something which should be on the, on the front burners of thinking about a way to integrate into the, the labor force and giving meaningful jobs to um, the immigrant community. Finally, point number seven. The, the elephant in the room, ethnic heterogeneity is hugely correlated with riots both across countries, within the US, almost everywhere. It's different ethnic groups fighting each other. It's no, it's no surprise that, that, in fact, the US is the second most riot prone country in the world over the past 30 years. Number one is India, where it's, it's, it's Hindus and Muslims uh, fighting that cause things. Within the US, race or ethnicity are always apparent. Even the 1863 draft riot, the deadliest riot in US history, was one in which there were huge ethnic undertones where uh, Irish and German immigrants to New York rebelled against the idea of being drafted to go fight, go fight in the South. Eth the ethnic hatred that fuels riots is almost always and everywhere fueled with stories of crimes and atrocities committed by the other ethnic group. They're abundant here. They're abundant in the whites who then vilify the immigrants. They're abundant in you know, Le Pen and you know, uh, the various stories. And they're also, I, I, I don't have, don't have, you're having your exact phrase, the radical imams, they're also, they're also clear in, that, in their language as well. There also is a tendency to vilify at the same time. And this is also the, the kindling of, of riots, is the use of stories. The important thing, though, to remember is that we shouldn't be too attracted by whether or not, you know, by whether or not the stories are true or not. The stories tend to exist whether or not they're true or not. The Hep Hep riots against Jews in, in Frankfurt in 1819 did not depend upon the truth of whether or not the Jews were criminals, nor did the Atlanta race riot depend upon the truth of whether or not there was an actual you know, rape, of a, rape of a white woman by an African American. It depended upon the political entrepreneurs spreading stories of hatred. Um, and again, you know, this is why I think the previous speaker is exactly right, thinking about the political equilibrium in France and the question of whether or not we, we are at a situation in which the leaders of, of all ethnicities have the incentive to actually work together to sow some, some sort of united, united France, or whether or not they have the incentives to just build hatred against the other group, that seems to me absolutely crucial. So I think, as, as I would think forward, I would think about improving policing in a way that combines effectiveness with sensitivity. The answer is not dictatorship and repression, but the answer is not ineffectiveness either. And I, and I hope Chris will, will talk about that. Two, thinking about unemployment, and three, most crucially, thinking about ways to, to solve the ethnic problems without eliminating the important ethnic identities of all, of all the groups involved. Thank you very much, Professor Lisa. <laughs> we now turn to Professor Stone for his thoughts on the question. Thank you. Um, Nice uh, pickup on, on many of Ed's themes. If, if uh, 
I was going to say, to start, that about the, what are the causes of this? Why is Paris burning? And I only have a partial answer to that. And it was exactly the, the, the start that Ed made. That is, it's not, we know it's not just about poverty or that poverty doesn't become the trigger for it and equality. But instead of, and, and I take the point about unemployment, but I want to focus uh, in addition on the question of justice and the perception of injustice. Those are words like racism and like the questions of race that um, sometimes just confound us. And so we, we, the policy answers aren't as clear as they might be with unemployment. So we don't, we don't embrace the word as much. But the perception of injustice um, here, I think, is, is crucial to, to see, and particularly the way it plays out in Paris. The, the injustice. Uh, the triggered, at least we, we are told, triggered the Paris events, is an injustice both operating at the social level, the economic level, Ed's talked about that, but also immediately in the neighborhoods where the riots began. And, this, and the injustice there is injustice directly at the hands of the police. The two boys who were electrocuted at the beginning, on October 27th, the beginning of this event, we're told are, we're fleeing the police. The police are very quick to say, we weren't chasing them. There was no police chase here. And there's a debate back and forth about that. But in a sense, it's even worse if they weren't, if the police weren't chasing these young men. The point is the police had chased so many young men in this part of Paris so often that when these 10 young men were coming home from a football game and they see a police squad, which the police say was actually on a different errand, they know the police are going to stop them for an identity check. They know what those identity checks can involve. Hours in a police station, sometimes waiting for others to come and get you. And sometimes the questioning that goes on in an identity check in these suburbs is not the kind of questioning we might imagine of a police officer detaining some young men for a short time. Often they're on, prone on the ground, one of them reporting often the police's foot on their face. These are, uh, this is the injustice that had become routine in these, uh, in these areas for these young men. And it's that reason why we, uh, we're told these young men coming home from a game see the police coming and run, leading to the tragic death of two of them. That, that, that injustice is, uh, it, Ed called it the flashpoint of so many riots. Um, and we so quickly move from that flashpoint to other um, to other solutions, other causes. And I'm glad, Ed, and I would certainly encourage us to think about that cause itself as a cause worth addressing in its own right. It, it may be that while we must deal with issues of inequality, poverty, unemployment, racism, to do that in a setting where we are taking on and doing something about injustice, I would submit is a lot easier, and you can create a moment of good faith to work on other, other issues. But if you ignore the, the injustice right in front of you, then great plans to deal with employment, to rebuild the areas. If you aren't dealing with the injustice of the police right in front of you, those other things will not be built on a good foundation. That's the first point. The second point is about the double role of the police. In many riots, as Ed was describing, the police at their best can act as a neutral calm, trying to restore order between two groups angry at each other, whether it's the miners in England worried about the employers who are locking them out, or two religious or ethnic groups fighting each other in many of Ed's examples. The police, the goal of good policing at that moment is not to be identified with one side or the other, but to try and create order, restore order, so the problems can be addressed another way. But of course, in circumstances like this, as in Watts, as in Liberty City, uh, the police are, aren't just, the, media, aren't just the, the restorer of order. They are actually the object of the rage of so many in the crowd. And you see this in what happened in Paris. We saw this from the very beginning of the, of the police effort to be deployed to restore order, essentially creating a target uh, for the anger of the, of the young men, particularly young men, in those neighborhoods. And so you had reports very quickly of the police there to restore order, becoming themselves the target, claiming to take fire, responding with tear gas, responding with rubber bullets. And you have a cycle that we saw play itself out as the attacks aren't just now on cars, but on the police themselves. So that, 
So if the first cause, in a sense, is in first answer to the question, why is it burning, is injustice, the second cause may be policing itself and the policing of the disorder. The third, the third point is, is about the failure to break the cycle. There are opportunities for political leaders in moments like that, as much as one would like to have avoided it in the first place, to have addressed it before it began. Even in the midst of this problem, even on November 6th in Paris, there were opportunities for political leadership to, uh, to deal with this in a way that could restore order more quickly and address the issues of justice. And those opportunities in Paris, as in so many other places before, were missed, in my view. Um, the, those opportunities usually take the form, uh, the political leadership must restore order at a moment like that. You, do, you simply do not have the option as the president of France or the leader of any polity dealing with this. As, um, as uh, the first President Bush, George Bush, on the night of the riots in Los Angeles after the acquittal of the police officers in the Rodney King case, um, addressed the nation on television as Los Angeles was burning. And he said immediately he is going to restore order. The violence will end, he promised, that night in Los Angeles. But he then went on to spend most of his speech talking about justice. And the, uh, the ambition to combine, uh, to combine uh, the need to restore order with the promise of justice um, is one approach, I think a pretty good approach, for political leadership at a moment like that. Here, unfortunately, justice and restore order became not an integrated policy, but almost a Mutt and Jeff routine. We had two competing presidential hopefuls one standing for restoring order and one standing for some version of social justice. And so the policy of the government became fractured as if these two things were opposed to each other, as if the country had to choose between doing social justice and restoring order. And of course, that was, in my view, the principal failure of political leadership at that moment. The challenge of political leadership is to integrate those two, to do, as Ed was saying, to do, the, to do policing or the delivery of justice, delivery of order, effectively and respectfully, and in a way that, that wins, the, wins the, the society back. And we've seen that, I think, unfortunately, continue. You can contrast, there were, surprisingly, many of the commentators have talked about this, surprisingly few arrests, actually, in the face of these riots. We were told every day, 100, 200. The peak was 395 on, um, I believe, the 14th of November. Um, uh, arrests in one day across all of France. But remember, the New York City Police Department, in five hours of the Republican National Convention, with no riots going on, arrested 1,800 people. So we police, police know. Police know how to arrest large numbers of people to, pr to produce order, at least if that's the ambition. The numbers here, while <laughs> reported every day on the radio as if this was a huge number, were nothing, nothing compared with how modern police forces can, um, if that's their strategy, do it. Uh, in contrast, however, of the, of the hundreds, now about, about uh, uh, there were about 2,000 people arrested in the three weeks of the period, uh, uh, this all went on across all of France. There have been, at last count that I've seen, about 700 of those cases have come for fast track trials in the courts, and um, several hundred have been convicted. I think it's, oh, it's now over 400. But the sentences uh, being, uh, being handed down are actually quite frightening. They're not huge by American standards, but they're going up to about three or four years and there are many of a year, year and a half, two years um, uh, sentences for people, for young men who are caught up in this, who are found by the police in a crowd around a burning vehicle. Um, somebody's thrown a, a Molotov cocktail. Um, they check for gasoline on the hands. There's confused stories. They're all taken down. And then they're tried. And there's a series of statements. In a situation like that, uh, you're going to get some of these wrong. I mean, interesting, thousands of, of arrests in, 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 in an American uh, situation like this, the 1800 in New York with, with relatively little, little violence, but almost no sentences of more than a few days. I mean, the, the one strategy, you may not want a lot of arrests, but there is one strategy of, well, let's do a lot of arrests, but then let's basically let everybody go when the problem's over. It was so confused. The goal is to get people out of harm's way and out of the, out of the melee. 
Here the strategy is different, and people will be serving time for very ambiguous roles in this for months and in some cases years. And in that sense, the cycle begins again. Even if the judges are brilliant, they're going to get a bunch of these cases wrong. Um, and, and they may not be brilliant. So the, so, the, <laughs> so the result will be families, communities, individuals will have people doing time now back in that cycle where the, just, where the justice system is again producing another round of frustration, another sense of injustice, and the cycle will continue. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to mention that um, uh, Professor Skip cannot attend this uh, event because he's, uh, he's due to undergo surgery and he's gone over to New York for this. <coughs> but of course, he's present with us in spirit. You can be sure about that. So having said that, I would like to call on Professor Maxima to um, intervene in the discussion. Daniel. Thank you. First of all, I uh, apologize for my bad English. I will say like the Beatles, all I want is a little help for my friend <laughs> Abiola <laughs> for translation sometimes. Uh, those young people uh, who did not burn Paris, but their own houses in suburbs are French. They did not come to the symbols of politics to, uh, to burn the Bastille or the Assembly. They committed quite a suicide, burning themselves, burning the cars of the neighbors of parents. And this proved a, a barrier between politics, between the representation, and between themselves. They were in a prison, and that's why these happen. In fact, there is a social problem for them and for their parents, which is they have no work. Uh, in the chômage, uh, unemployment. the unemployment situation, you have both children and parents for the first time. Uh, in the past, immigration was uh, connected with work. A lot of people, Arabs, came to France because they need them for work. When I was a young teacher for uh, the elder brothers of those uh, uh, young people, the parents have work. They were in Renault, in Peugeot. They leave the house at four in the morning to uh, have money for their children. 20% of the people in the suburbs are under what we call the level of poverty. And in France, the whole France, it's 6%. That means more of them. The only problem is how a social problem who exist uh, transform in this. First, because no uh, political uh, representation of this. So we have in France a crisis of politics who does not understand what happens in France. And in that sense, people of politics, either left or right, uh, find other reasons to explain. And that's why I raise cultural, religious reasons, trying to show that those young are not French. They are not integrated. They have problems of integration. This is completely false. They are French, and it's because they want to have all that French have that they revolt. So it's a revolt who proves the quality of integration that they succeeded and that their parents succeeded in, and not at all who proved the failure of integration. Another thing, it's a crisis of representation, because we saw even <laughs> here in CNN those people for the first time. Because in French television, you do not see much people, colored people. You don't see much Arabs. You don't see much black people. And it is a very great lack 
of representation of the real nature of friends today. And in this lack, you just show those people when they burned. And an image of people refusing come for everything, for everyone, uh, hiding the real image of people really wanting to be completely French. This is a great problem. It is not an American problem. It's a problem of the no representation, the absence of representation of the real France in French media. Another thing, they say those people must be foreigners, uh, people issued from immigration. They are French, their parents are French 20 years ago. Their elder parents came from Algeria or from some uh, places of ex-colonial and francophone places. But since two generations, they are French. And sometimes uh, police ask them their uh, f paper of immigrate, and they have the French carte d'identité, the identity card. They have it, and their parents have it. This uh, means that it's not a cultural problem because France transform very often problem of integration, which is a problem of citizenship in a problem of cultural distance and cultural difference. France is based on the idea of the unity of France. It's not the nation, it's the republic. And in a republic, everyone can enter, even if you are not born or if you are not of the same ethnic. And this is, I think, we explain what makes France uh, fear of its uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But we have never to forget that this is not French. If we say it's universal, it's because at the beginning, it means during the years of the revolution, people in the West Indies, people in the French colonies, slaves, took this for granted and asked 1794 to be also citizen of the Republic. And they succeeded in it. So the model was the first model, and it's the original model of France, because it was taken by people not far from here in the Caribbean and people of African origin. This model is the model of integration. But the problem is that as France builds this republic with many different cultures, many different ethnies, they, they hide this idea behind another one. To be a citizen, you have to leave your original culture, which is the paradox of France. It is as if you can only be a French if you uh, suppress what makes your originality to be equal. It means that liberté, égalité, but you are not libre to be different in the French ideology. Not in the French reality, but in the French uh, discourse, speech about what France is, which makes, it's not hypocrisy, it's not lie. It's the, the problem of France is that the reality of integration is very often hidden because it's a problem of the same and the other. And when you mix both of them, it's very difficult to have a political speech about this because people want to be uh, separate, to have a simple definition of what they are. So, Every time you have a problem in France, people try to, see, to say it's because you are different, because you are not integrated. That's why they speak of Islam, they speak of polygamy, they speak of a lot of things that those young people does not know and does not support. In fact, those young people are against Islamists. They don't, it's not they are fighting against Islamists. They are not in this field. They are French. French of Arab or Kabyle origin, French of black origin, 
French or France origin. When you have riots between groups, it's between blocks in France. And in those fight of young people, you find in the, like in West Side Story, it's not a, uh, one uh, blacks against Arabs against friends. In the groups A, you have blacks, Arabs, and French. In the group B, against them, you have French uh, of origin, Arabs, and uh, uh, Chinese, and blacks. And they fight because it's the unity of the bloc, of the republic they form, or the prison in which they are against the, the, the next one. I think this is the success of the French systems, but this is not said in politics, is not said in the media, because you have no discourse, speech of this, because métissage is not an ideology. It's just a reality who comes after. You don't choose to do this. It's not a political project to mix. And that makes a very difference between the French intellectual who cannot explain what happens, and that every time this happens, and you see that youth is a community that people understand less. Just some example, we did the same in 1968. We were young people trying to make a, a new image of the reality of France, and uh, Paris, the center of Paris, was quite burning at this time, not the suburbs. It was a whole generation who was building new France, and the whole political system did not understand this, and it makes years to be integrated in what in France. Another example is when we had the presidential uh, uh, election with, you know, the surprising of the extreme droite, Le Pen, become second. You and uh, Chirac, only Republican left, and people, and Le Pen in the second, the second, the second tour, the second part. In two weeks, the whole use of France was in the streets. People were 14 years old until 20 years old. No one was behind them to tell them to do so. You have a youth who just say to the adult, are you mad? We want a republic and we will tell them. And after, they could not vote. And the adult votes after 80% for Chirac. And one thing, the night of the result at 8 o'clock, Chirac and his wife went to, to, for the, uh, to celebrate this. And in the streets, you have 80% of people who are blacks and Arabs and were applauding. And people of the television were looking for white people to say that it's not only in the place of the Hotel de Ville, you have a crowd of people, black and white, because they know that Republic was on their side. I think this is quite also a thing we have to keep in mind when we try to explain those kind of uh, situation. Yes. Yeah, We want to proceed straight away to the question and answer session. So if you have any question, uh, please raise your hand and identify yourself and come up to the uh, microphone. Please identify yourself. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Reg McKean, Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. Um, and there are two questions uh, that I would like the panel to give me more help in understanding. Of course, uh, a month ago in the media, there was a tremendous amount of attention to these disturbances in the Montlieu. Um, and then it dropped off the uh, a focus of, of our news. Um, at one point, uh, was it the second week that there were car burnings in, was it in two other countries, was it Brussels and Bremen? Uh, and it appeared that the disturbances might even spread to other European countries. Uh, but that uh, really didn't, to, 
didn't seem to happen to any large extent. So um, um, I, I need help in understanding what exactly brought the disturbances to an end. Uh, and I'm also um, interested in why um, the uh, rioters were um, large, I guess, um, North African and not Sub-Saharan African, that is to say, why, why did the Arabs riot but not the black Africans? Is that actually correct, that only the Arabs rioted and not the black Africans? I mean, we have to get this clear. I am, I am here to learn from the panel. Okay, well, does anybody here want to take that up? Uh, Professor Glazer? Or Mathieu? Yeah, they, they had 23% French French, uh, French issues. Okay. And then they had, uh, you know, black, uh, blacks of African descent and Arabs. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, to me it's not what stopped the riots because they had a curfew, but it's why didn't the riots stop sooner? That's really what's interesting to me because uh, I kept looking for public intellectuals or politicians or leaders, cultural leaders who could come on television and tell people to stop and have people listen to them, and I didn't find those people. I don't know a lot of cases of riots that peter out on their own without the use of some form of policing or force, right? And, and curfews are an example of that. For example, the draft riot ended because the, uh, the northern troops were freed after the victory at Gettysburg to come back to New York to impose, to impose order. You mean 18, exactly. 1863 in, in New 1863, York City? 1863, yeah. And that's, you know, every, every place you look at, there's, there's, a, there's some sort of imposition, uh, some sort of imposition of order. Is that, um, can we have another question? Yeah, yeah, okay, you're already. Uh, Omar abdul uh, my, my question is a uh, general one to the uh, panel. Uh, first of all, it, it seems clear to me that the, one of the reasons for the uh, riots is the uh, financial and um, uh, political instability, and that's, you know, basically as a result of lack of uh, human and financial capital in the regions. And I was wondering if any of you were aware of any uh, strategies that the French government or local groups were doing to correct that um, particular problem. The other thing is that um, there's much has been written about the role of, of Islam, uh, both positive and negative, uh, in instigating or quelling uh, these, these disturbances. And also the role of, um, of uh, the hip hop uh, movement and the music uh, and the rappers and all that. And I was wondering if, uh, again, if anyone in the panel has any uh, uh, information other than what we've been hearing in the media. Thank you. Can you say something about the hip hop? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not just the yeah. hip hop, but also the literature. If you, I mean, you know, texts like, um, La Préférence Nationale, yeah. uh, even Azuz Begag, who is now a minister, he wrote his autobiography, and all the problems of the uh, North Africans are actually, you know, exposed in that, in that mm -hmm. text. But, you know, let's focus on the hip-hop. Yeah, I, th I think that Chirac has addressed the nation and has promised to, you know, put a lot of money in the schools to bring some of the people of uh, Afri sub Saharan African descent and Arabs into many of the school systems, and they want to change the housing system, the architecture and everything, build smaller houses. Uh, I think, in many sense, France want you know, there is this whole exception culturelle, uh, according to which France wants to be different from America. But France is very much like America nowadays. Uh, and, and that's really something confusing because when it comes to policing, police brutality, violence, militarization of the police, the France takes a page right out of America. But when it comes to integrating people, France is against affirmative action. In fact, they don't even have, they, the word they have it for it is uh, positive, uh, discrimination positive. Yeah, positive discrimination. But they don't even have a good word for it, <laughs> you know. Uh, 
so, so in a way, uh, the French media has accused uh, polygamy and uh, hip hop, rap music, in, in, in a way. And, and it's possible, you know, the, the French youth today is like Chinese youth, African youth, uh, they all sing rap. That's, that's what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. The extent to which they will respond. I, I think I agree with the point, the way rights start, you know, it's the perception of injustice. It's not the hip hop or the rap that started the riots. Just a word, uh, culture is a proof that uh, in fact, France is much more metis than the uh, discourse or political says. For instance, about music. Uh, in fact, you have a, a mixture who makes what they call rai, which was a mixture of what came from Algeria, traditional Oranese music, mixed with black music in the suburbs in France of, of today, and which makes that one of the most successful music is a music of Arab origin. Can we have... Uh... Jean, Jean Biem, yeah, well, people, can you please go ahead, yeah? yeah. Uh, Jean Biem from the GSAS. Uh, uh, please, very quickly. Okay, um, I'd like time. to, to uh, try to explore the, the over-determinations of the situation and then maybe ask a question about the perspectives. It is clear that um, the, uh, on the French social, um, French social texture, there is the question of social security, which, is, which, is, which may be central to this problem, and... Uh, there is a risk, given the policy of the Europe, European Union and the new policy of uh, Prime Minister Blair of England, to deprive France of its social security system, which means that France, if they were to adopt the, uh, the, the model that were trying to be passed through the constitution uh, that was rejected, France would no longer be able to afford to pay uh, jobless people just because they are French citizens. Now, it means that France does not actually have the means to support this policy on a long, on a long stand. And where did these means come from historically, it seems that they came from supporting dictatorships in uh, sub-Saharan Africa too. And these dictatorships in uh, these uh, countries that use the CFA currency guaranteed by France, this support for dictatorship is actually in the origin, I mean one of the origins of these mass immigrations from sub-Saharan Africa for instance. Now, it is to be expected that if leadership is going to change there, and France will be less able than before to have free raw material from this country to support its social security system. Now, if you take that and compare with uh, the, the impulse of Blair and the neoliberal economy, do you think that there is a possibility? I mean, uh, do you think we can expect more riots in France since the texture that guarantees this social security of free money from the state, uh, when it's going to collapse, what is going to happen? Yeah, does anybody want to bring that up? Mm. <laughs> Professor Glazer? Uh, you know, do I think it's going to collapse? I think, I think this is hard to say. I do think, look, I mean, the one thing that I think is absolutely critical is that France undergo labor market reforms that will increase the general participation for particularly young uh, young people in the labor market system. And I think in general, the sort of uh, particularly sort of high degree of regulation, uh, but also sort of in general, certain aspects of the welfare state have been uh, critical in terms of creating uh, just high levels of, of out of work young people, which I think is a, is a toxic, dangerous situation. Can we have a question on this side? Yes, please. Were you going to, yeah, uh, please. My name is Dudley Harton. Uh, and uh, first a slight comment. In Somerville, Massachusetts last week, there were two cars burned. Uh, Somerville's the next town up from here, and that's a higher percentage than was in Paris. But I would like to make a, <laughs> I would like to go and, and ask about, <clears throat> if you have comments about the difference between Paris and Marseille. In Paris, you leave Paris going north <laughs> towards the, the airport, and you go through primarily open country, and you come to these high-rise ghetto places that are where the um, problems were. Uh, there's no real transportation to Paris. Um, there's not much job, there's not much advantage. 
You go to Marseille, Marseille is, uh, is the second largest city in France, and it is a city that since for the last few thousand years has been immigrants and what have you who come from all different parts of the world. In Marseille, because of the mountains around it, there are no ghettos that are separated from the city. There are some ghetto-like things. But on the other hand, you'll find on the same street, you'll find a mosque and you'll find a synagogue. You'll find the people mixed together. You'll go down to the beach on the south of Marseille and you'll find a mixture of people. And it's, and they've had almost no trouble in Marseille. I, I don't know if they had zero burnings, but they had almost none. Do you have comments about these? Can we have a question from up there on the balcony? Uh, I'm Erwin Turbot. I'm a police officer from Northern Ireland. I've been involved in a large number of riots in my life. Um, I wanted to take some issue with the point about how easy it is to arrest people in a riot situation. <coughs> I think it depends on whether the police are prepared for the situation and the comparison between the spontaneous rioting in Paris and the prepared policing operation for the Republican Convention, I think, was unfair and unhelpful. Uh, if you're given six months to prepare for something, it's not difficult to arrest 1,400 people. If something happens spontaneously and you're reacting very much uh, off the cuff, it's very difficult. I doubt if there was a prosecution strategy, which was another phrase was used, and I suspect that the French criminal justice system as a whole struggled greatly to deal with something that they weren't expecting to erupt. So that's the first point. Second point, I think, is about how important good policing is with regard to public order. I agree with that. But I think that bad policing is as much a feature of the society from which the police emerge, and I don't think the police alone should be asked to take responsibility for that. Professor Stone, would you like to? Sure, no, I, I, I completely take the, the point about um, about the difference between prepared situations and unprepared situations. But it's also true that police today in capital cities around the world prepare for riots. And when the, when the police were, de were deployed over this three week period, I mean that, that, that can explain maybe the first week, the first 10 days. But this went on for three weeks. And I think it's part of the earlier question we had about why the, why the subsidence and I mean, we could go into the, into the, into the sort of week-by-week week or day-to-day day -day police deployment that was done here. But I think it's simply not true that police in capitals today simply don't prepare for riot situations. There is a fair amount of training. There's a lot of tactical discussion. And there's a lot of tactical training by both at the level of command and at the level on the, on the ground. Um, so I, I simply don't think this is a, I don't think any, any capital police today uh, facing this kind of situation, which is not completely out. I mean, this was, a, this was not a completely impossible to police set of disorders. Um, and I think that the, uh, so I think the response to it is, in a sense, um, tells us something about how it was prepared for, how the police saw themselves in those roles. Uh, but I take your point that the, that the, uh, that the, that the, that the precise difference is, 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 is not the same. I think the the question about sentencing and the question about prosecution policy, um, while it's not prepared for usually anywhere, um, it usually is deliberative. Um, that is, the, uh, um, whether, the, whether the, uh, the discussions that take place in any jurisdiction among prosecutors and courts about the policies that are being pursued now um, are usually um, uh, are deliberative and are usually discussed both at the prosecutorial level and at more senior levels of government. That may not have happened here, but I don't think we have any reason to think it didn't. Quick, quick response on policing coming from larger society. Absolutely true. And saying that the police can be improved is not in any sense to, to say that the police are to blame. But at the same time, it's a lot easier to fix a police force than it is to fix society as a whole. And I think that's why it actually makes sense to focus on reforming police. We have one last question. Well, uh -huh. two last questions. One from the, ga from the uh, balcony and one down here. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Miller. I'm a freshman in the college. Um, from research I've done about the Affaire des Voiles and other uh, aspects of, uh, and, and the current riots, um, it seems to me that the rhetoric and public policy in France is informed by a distressingly unnuanced understanding of the constituent cultures that make up France's heterogeneity, as Professor Glazer put it. Um, it also seems that France is beginning to understand the necessity of, of coming up with a more nuanced understanding of, of the groups that make up French society and the complexity involved. Um, my question uh, to the panel is, 
Which uh, organ of government in France do you think could lead the way? Uh, would it be the Conseil d'État? Would it be the bureaucracy? Could it be a holistic approach from the president? Uh, and then also outside the government, um, do you see a, a constructive role from uh, the media um, or potentially French academia uh, evolving over the course of the next decade? Thank you. That's a question for Daniel, but yeah. I, I have to explain very quickly what the question is about. You know, quel organisme serait capable, justement, n'est-ce pas, de répondre, enfin, d'initier de, des, des, des réformes, enfin, de euh, provoquer une compréhension, justement, de la diversité culturelle en France Puisque tu as posé le problème, quel organisme <laughs> les, les intellectuels ou bien le Conseil d'État ou bien... Non, non. Oui, oui. OK. Uh, you know, there's a... Comment, un retard. Uh, uh, lateness, uh, uh, tardiness, if you like, you know, yeah. Of the politics, uh, looking at this or what happens. So it's very difficult to have a political representation of, of this. So it's not Conseil d'État or something. We, it's not a question of the law they have to do. It's a question of recognizing the civil society and to hear to what the civil society says and to transform it also in politics. The problem is that uh, the lack of political uh, solution is because people in politics believe again that identity is based on the past of the ancestors. And what those young people shows is that the real identity is a fruit with base of what you deal with the future. And in between these is the lack of real political consciousness of what happens. But it's also good because politics cannot be completely uh, uh, a translation of what happens in the society. The freedom is also in this. The society uh, advances. And you know, there's a sentence of the philosopher Michel Foucault who was just saying that Identity is not a position, it's a movement. Just to actually, let me, let me just say something quickly on this, which is, you know, the, one of the remarkable things about France is that French ethnic homogeneity is just a thing of the 20th century, right? I mean, the 19th century was one, as Eugene Weber so eloquently, you know, wrote, in which all the vast ethnic differences in France were ironed out by a combination of the army, the bureaucracy, particularly the schools, not to mention the role, the role of the roads. The question is whether or not that's good or not. And certainly that is one way forward to do to the immigrant populations what were done to the Bretons or the, the people of the Languedoc in, in the 19th century. But it's very far from obvious that that's a, that's a policy that we in any sense could sign off on in the, in the 21st century where we put a you know, much greater val you know, value on individual rights, on individual diversity. And I think before we should ask whether or not which organ should do it, I think we don't know how in the world we're actually gonna handle ethnic heterogeneity uh, in France, given that, the, that enforcing homogeneity is unacceptable, but on the other hand, ethnic heterogeneity itself can often be toxic. One last question. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Emo de Medeiros, um, and um, I will make a, a quick point and then ask a question to all of the remaining speakers. Um, I, uh, a literary scholar made a scandal once by calling a Conrad a bloody racist. I hope I won't create a similar scandal here by stating that I think, and I am French, my, uh, my mother is technically French, and I have French nationality, that I think that France is today a bloody racist country. It is easily demonstrable. <coughs> um, I think I, not being a speaker and only asking questions is not the time to develop it. Uh, <coughs> and, but my experience in the US was not that much different, meaning I, I was stopped in a car with two African-American friends in New York for just no reason. And uh, the policeman that was standing behind me, I was behind, standing behind, uh, uh, behind the car, the rear of the car, constantly kept repeating to put my hands, whereas the three people who were there were, I'm an artist, uh, my friend, uh, the friend who was driving is a doctor, medical doctor, and the third one is a comedian. So um, I, I am a guest here, so I won't make any bold statement that would be comparable to the one I made about France. But, um, but, and, but if I compare um, um, both uh, uh, positions as I, and I refuse to use the word race, uh, that's, um, I'm working on that. My, I make a PhD on the notion of race uh, in the US from 1965 to 2005. So um, my question is, the 
Both positions treat, relating to ethnicity are very different. France pretends to be colorblind, which is actually uh, um, count, uh, counter demonstrated or informated or uh, non I mean, the opposite concept of validated by uh, everyday evidence. And, uh, and, and concretely, if, if I take the definition of Professor Appia about racism, which differentiate extrinsic, intrinsic, and uh, racialism, I think that uh, uh, at least it can be said that, you, that the USA are a deeply racialist country. And uh, I wish, for example, that the f affirmative action itself is not only racialist, but it's technically racist because it selects people and ga gave, gives them people uh, advantages depending on their phenotype and not necessarily um, on others. So my question is, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, please <laughs> ask, please uh, ask. I'm sorry. Question. Uh, my, my question is, do you think there is a third way possible that would both avoid the Jacobinism of uh, France and this sort of, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, strong differenti differentiation uh, or a, a, a postulate of, uh, because I think it's in 2000 you can, could check one more, more than one box. So this tradition of uh, separating and, and considering the communities are he heterogeneous. Thank you. Well, who wants to take this up? Professor Stone? Uh, why don't you go for one last question up there? Well, that was going to be the last oh, was, question. Oh, oh. But okay, let's see whether this has any relation. <laughs> see, if we can do, see if we can do better on the last yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because this is the very last question. Absolutely. So. Um, I had a quick question. I suppose it's on the nature of riots. In the, um, if it's a spontaneous occurrence, I, I don't think it's surprising that the riots would have occurred in the suburbs where people were living, and so the cars being burned were um, owned by people of the same ethnicity and same um, religious beliefs, but is it strange that over the three-week period there wasn't a significant shift to, you know, the central these bonds, like there wasn't any attack on the Palais de Justice or something, that these continued in the, in the areas and were primarily attacks on people of the same color? Look, the, the, the critical, I mean, the critical yeah. business in riots being that the probability of arrest drops incredibly low. The probability of arrest would not have been incredibly low for the first rioter who went to the Palais de Justice. The probability of arrest would have been close to one. So, I mean, I think it's not a surprise that riots are often incredibly localized in an area in which policing just completely breaks down. Um, the only exceptions that I can think of are ones in which the riots really are organized, which they were, say, in 1863, when sort of en masse a group will go to a different area. But that localization is a feature of, crime, of riots, and I think crime in general. I mean, it's the... Maxima wants to say a word. No, no. no, no. Oh, okay, Professor Stone, no. please. But the... Uh, I mean, I think that... I think, I think it's important to, to, to distinguish but what we're why the riots matter in a sense, because that's really what these last two questions are really. There are, um, the test of a good social policy is not whether it produces riots or not. And, and it's not as if any social policy that we produce, that doesn't produce a riot must be good. And that because one produces a riot, then it must be bad. The, 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 the riots, I think, as, and I think that's what, what several of the comments have been getting at, represent a different kind of breakdown. And so analyzing where the, riot, where the riots spread, how it moves, where it goes, is not a map of the nature of the concern or the importance of the issue. It may be an issue, it may be a sign of the organization of the rioters, but other than that, it probably is much, and since no one was claiming this was organized um, disorder, I think I share a sense that this was, this was, it wasn't a surprise that it moved. I think that, and in a sense, it also wasn't a surprise that it that it that it ended as it did. Uh, but I do think I do think it's important to to distinguish the the debate about what we do about them from our analysis of what of what the of how they move and what their nature is. And I think that was where we began, in some sense, this evening. Just, just, just yeah. a word about France. France is or France is not. I think these impious to understand anything because it does not exist France to say is it a racist country or not racist country. What is quite uh, the uh, way to racism is to speak of a country like a rule. Uh, 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 one thing, for instance, France does not say this, but France was made also. And the fight against racism was made also by people who were victims of racism and who were within France, with the colonies, and after, for instance, people of uh, French West Indies, like, like my country, etc. This means that uh, when we speak of France, 
we don't speak only of what France says about itself, but also what is hidden between, which is a fight of people who oblige, in fact, France to be more open to the world, to be more open against racism, even if it is not. And the fight of the people, like those young people, is a fight inside France, who is making what we call France also. It's not like you have people outside and we have a block who call France and you see how people uh, deal with this. It is France and those people are making France and are France and in that sense, it's not only a question, is France racist with them because they are the future of France also. Okay, well, I'm, I'm afraid we have to stop here. I wish we could go on and you can see this is a very complex problem, but I think that the discussion this evening has been extremely uh, illuminating, stimulating uh, for further reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you.